All right, wonderful. Uh, as I said earlier, my name is Amanda Menking. I'm the Director of Programs both at the Trust and Safety Professional Association, which is hosting this webinar, and at the Trust and Safety Foundation. Most of you probably know what TSPA is, uh, and you probably found out about this webinar through TSPA, but for those of you who don't know, uh, TSPA is a nonprofit uh, supporting the global community of people working in online trust and safety. So we are a professional member association. We work alongside trust and safety teams and individuals to help folks develop their expertise and skills and to establish relationships to kind of navigate this really unique profession. Um, we run forums for professionals to connect with one another, to build a network and a community, to talk about ideas of how trust and safety is done uh, on different platforms, uh, different types of content, communities, behaviors, and to find guidance on how to think about their own career path, uh, as well as how to share their expertise. So this is what we call a member expert presentation. So uh, folks who wanna share their expertise with the rest of us and our guests have graciously volunteered to do so today. It's so really grateful for them. So just an outline of what's gonna happen today. So Anu and Neha will present first and then Rory will present. And then as I mentioned earlier, we'll have a dedicated time for a Q&A after the presentations. And you can use that Q&A feature in Zoom to ask your questions. If you have general questions for TSPA as far as like accessing resources or things like that, Crystal and I might answer them uh, just directly via text, uh, but most uh, questions will go to our panelists, we hope. Okay, one more thing, chat is disabled for participants. So make sure you use that Q&A feature if you want to ask questions. Okay, so we heard a little bit about where our panelists are at and what time it is and what the weather's like, but now I'm going to hand it over to each one of them to provide a brief intro. I know your bios are on the event, right? So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about kind of what your day-to-day -day looks like and the work you do, um, and uh, we'll kick it off with uh, Neha. Thanks, Amanda. Hello all, I, I'm Neha Vijay. I head the trusted safety function here at Radix. For those of you who do not know the company well, Radix is one of the largest domain level registries. It owns 10 top level domains, some of which are extremely popular, such as .online, .tech, .store, .site, etc. Um, looking at the trust and safety issues of a domain registry, my role is primarily to ensure that we have stringent operations and policies in place that allow us to detect domain abuse and take appropriate actions on them so as to prevent their spread to the rest of the internet. I have been with Radix for a year now, so definitely not an expert in domains. But before Radix, um, I was mostly working with content platforms, including the Wikimedia Foundation and then Netflix. So coming to Radix and leading the trust and safety function of a domain registry has taught me an incredible amount of things, uh, all things about internet and infrastructure. And I'm happy to talk about some of it well, at least the security aspects of it with you all today. Um, thank you. And uh, I have Anu with me from my team who's going to help me do that. Anu, do you want to tell the group a little bit about yourself? So, thank you, Nia. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining in today. Uh, my name is Anu. Uh, I lead the operational efforts for trust and safety at Radix. Um, I have been associated with the domain industry uh, for a little over 16 years, and my competence lies in domain abuse mitigation and uh, compliance handling. Uh, just like Nia mentioned, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, it's it's been a good journey so far. Uh, my uh, previous uh, experiences with uh, have been with uh, domain registration registrars uh, and hosting businesses. Uh, we, me, along with Neha, uh, run the trust and safety uh, efforts here at Radix, and uh, we're doing good so far, uh, and we hopefully continue to do so. Thank you. Over to you, Rory. Thanks, Anu. Hi, everyone. My name is Rory. Uh, I'm a senior open source intelligence analyst at Tech Against Terrorism. I'm going to give a bit more of an intro into Tech Against Terrorism, otherwise known as TAT, in my presentation, but just a brief overview of what I do. Um, in the team, I work in the open source intelligence team, as my title might suggest, uh, where largely I monitor and disrupt terrorist use of the internet. We do this quite a through quite a few different work streams, uh, most notably being the Terrorist Content Analytics Platform, which is a bespoke 
tool we use to uh, send URLs containing terrorist content to the affected tech platforms. But I'm also leading on our work to better disrupt, analyze, and understand terrorist operated websites, which is going to be the topic of my discussion uh, shortly later on. Thanks very much. All right, I think we'll hand it over to the Radix team for their presentation now. Amazing. Anu, do you want to get, get us started? Sure. Thank you, Nia. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, your time is valuable, and I'm honored to have you here. So quickly moving on to the purpose of uh, why we are here. Uh, uh, as you already know the agenda, I'll briefly speak about DNS abuse, the different types of uh, abuse and its impact, and then hand it over to Neha to talk more about how Radix as a registry put in our efforts to handle DNS abuse and the challenges we face. Domain name system is the fundamental technology used on the internet uh, to translate human-friendly domain names into IP addresses, uh, which is used by computers and other devices to communicate with each other. Needless to say, DNS is the backbone of internet communication, enabling users to navigate the web, locate resources, and communicate online efficiently. Without DNS, the internet, uh, as we know today, would be significantly more challenging to use and manage. Having said that, in every seal of good, there's always a piece of bad, and so we have to deal with the DNS abuse. Uh, what is DNS abuse, right? Any malicious activity aimed at disrupting the DNS infrastructure or causing the DNS to operate in an unintended manner. Uh, the unethical or malicious use of a DNS system encompasses a range of activities uh, that exploit or or use or abuse the DNS system for nefarious purposes. Uh, these actions often have uh, harmful consequences, not just for individuals or organizations, uh, but for the internet as a whole. Uh, it is often defined as being composed of five broad categories of harmful activities in so far as they intersect with the DNS. Let us now look at uh, some of the most common types of uh, DNS abuse. Starting off with phishing, cyber criminals uh, create deceptive domain names that closely resemble legitimate ones to trick users into uh, divulging sensitive information such as login credentials, credit card numbers, or uh, personal data. Malware dis uh, distribution, another uh, form of um, uh, and common uh, DNS abuse. Domain names are used to distribute malware such as viruses, trojans, and ransomware. Uh, by redirecting users to infected websites or downloading malicious files. Uh, this is done by setting up DNS records to point to uh, malicious IP addresses or exploit kits, uh, uh, facilitating the distribution of uh, malware to unsuspecting users. Uh, DNS can also be used uh, to facilitate email uh, spam campaigns or email spoofing. Uh, where the sender's addresses is false, tricking recipients into believing the message is from a legitimate uh, source. Attackers may also use DNS to resolve the uh, domains of spam email links or set up email servers on malicious domain names. Uh, farming is a cyber attack intended to redirect uh, a website's traffic to another uh, fake um, site by installing malicious uh, programs on the computers. Farming can be conducted either by gaining unauthorized access to victim's computer and changing the host files or by exploiting a vulnerability in the DNS system so so server software. Uh, botnet and command control. Uh, DNS uh, also acts as a medium for communication between uh, compromised devices and a central command server, allowing cy cyber criminals to control botnets for various malicious activities, including DDoS attack, data theft, and spam uh, distribution. Now, this is the, 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 the uh, types of abuse is not limited to ones that I just spoke, right? There are some other prominent DNS abuse, which include uh, fast flux hosting, which is a technique involved in rapidly um, changing the DNS records to hide the true uh, location of a malicious website. 
which makes it difficult to security systems to um, detect and block these uh, websites effectively. Um, similar to phishing attacks, uh, typo squatting is another form of um, of internet uh, uh, abuse. Like typo squatters, register domain names that are uh, similar to popular website but contain uh, typographical errors. Right, they rely on on users to uh, make uh, typing mistakes and end up on their deceptive websites. Some individuals may uh, also use DNS to host and distribute illegal content, such as uh, child sexual exploitation material by creating and sharing domain names that provide access to such um, illegal content. Um, here are the next slide. Yeah. Here are some examples of abuse instances uh, we have received and have been actioned upon, right? Uh, the first image, uh, it clearly shows is a phishing email of uh, IRS information uh, notice, a deceptive of the internal uh, revenue service. The second image uh, is a copy of uh, the a Twitter login, you know, which makes user believe that they are logging into the actual a legitimate website that's compromising their login credentials. Uh, the third one uh, is, of course, a scam email, which make recipient believe it is from their service provider and then make them click on the link in the email, leading to a malware attack on, onto their computer. Now, uh, all these categories of abuse can have significant and far-reaching uh, impacts uh, on uh, individuals organizations and the overall uh, internet ecosystem. Uh, here are some of the, the dreadful impacts of um, DNS abuse. Uh, starting off with security risk, right? DNS tunneling or hijacking can be used as to exfiltrate sensitive uh, data from compromised system, thus causing data breach. Fraudulent domain names are used for uh, phishing attacks, um, tricking individuals into revealing personal and financial information. And then you know what happens uh, thereafter. Loss of uh, trust and reputation, right? Organizations that fall victims to DNS abuse or are associated with uh, malicious domains may suffer reputational damages, eroding trust among their customers and partners. Uh, DDoS attacks uh, or cash poisoning can lead to unavailability of uh, online services, so, sorry, causing disruption to business and users. Amplification attacks where servers are abused to amplify um, DDoS attacks can uh, consume significant network resources and disrupt uh, services for multiple uh, parties, causing further downtime and service disruptions. Right? And while the whole world is progressing towards a digital era, uh, frequent encounters with the malicious website and phishing attacks can lead to reduced user confidence uh, in the overall security of the internet. Uh, thus losing trust in online services and undermining the stability of the internet, right? And then there's also um, privacy violation. DNS abuse may uh, also involve the, uh, the collection of user data with, without uh, the user's consent, violating their privacy rights and regulations. There's also uh, uh, legal consequences uh, um, and for the regulatories, right? DNS abuse may uh, result in like, legal and regulatory actions against individuals or organizations involved in such uh, malicious activities. Governments and law enforcement agencies may take measures to combat DNS abuse, which can have uh, implications of internet governance and regulations. Some organizations or countries may also implement blocking or filtering measures that can inadvertently uh, affect the legitimate online services. And with all these, uh, there's uh, uh, operational costs associated as well, right? Um, organizations may incur huge operational costs to detect, mitigate, and um, uh, to det or to investigate these abuse uh, incidents, which can strain uh, further resources. Right, so it's a it's a never ending um, impact list uh, for DNS abuse. But uh, all these, uh, there are some mechanisms to combat DNS abuse, uh, for which I'll now hand it over to Neha to talk about uh, some preventive and mitigation uh, procedures and the registry's role in do doing so. Uh, over to you, Neha. 
Thank you, Anu. Thank you for a technical walkthrough of DNS abuse and the impact it can have. Now, uh, before we move to registry specific conversations, I want us to have a look at a very high level picture of domain level infrastructure to get an understanding of where a registry is positioned. So at the beginning, we have ICANN, which is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. It's a nonprofit responsible for coordinating and maintaining the stability of global DNS. Basically, it's the organization that sets all top level rules for the internet. And then we have domain registries, which are the entities that own different kinds of TLDs and are responsible for managing the registration, administration, and coordinations of the domains they own. Then we have registrars, which uh, is usually a company or an organization that prov provides domain registration services to individuals, entities, or whoever who wants to buy the domain. And then finally, we have the customers who we know as registrants in domain world. Uh, many times there are resellers involved between registrars and registrars. But as I said, this is a highly simplified view. There are many entities involved in between, but we don't want to complicate it just yet. We are looking at it to get an idea of where a registry is situated in the whole uh, ecosystem. Now, being positioned relatively close to ICANN, a domain registry is expected to ensure certain measures to prevent abuse. In terms of requirements, registries are required to lay out policies that govern domain registrations and outline what constitutes abuse. And this includes defining what actions will be taken against domain name holders engaging in abusive behavior. Uh, registries required to set up easy abuse uh, reporting procedures. It is not mandated, but it is expected that it investigates reported abuse and take actions where necessary. Usually, as per ICANN, a registry is expected to do its investigation, but then pass on the report to a level below, that is to registrars for an action. And then registry can go on about focusing on setting up industry collaborations for effective abuse detection, reporting, and mitigation. But we at Radex, even though we are a registry, we take stringent actions on abuse because it is true that the primary action on abuse, be it suspension or revocation, falls on the registrars uh, and that a registry is not mandated to do so. But at the same time, it is also not prohibited from doing so. Therefore, at Radix, if we find credible evidence of a domain engaging in abusive activities, we we prefer to take it down. And this is because from our experience, we see that domain abuses are highly time sensitive. Uh, they spread across platforms within a matter of few minutes. And knowing about a confirmed abuse and waiting for an action for 24 and sometimes 48 hours doesn't always seem quite right. We do pass on the reports to registrars and inform them that we have taken so-and-so action, but we try and participate actively in monitoring and suspending abusive domain names. Uh, within our team on the operation side, we have strict abuse mitigation processes that are both reactive and proactive. So when I say reactive, we receive intelligence and abuse report feeds from a large number of security companies. Uh, we have set up detailed investigation processes to then uh, look deeper into those reports and act upon those reports. But uh, we also try and go a step further to use the feeds to assess and proactively take actions on similar potentially abusive names because several abuse reports contain highly valuable information on registration patterns, hints on malicious intent, evidence signs of brand infringement. So we use uh, these uh, inputs wherever available to improve our proactive abuse handling efficiency as well. Now, off late, we have also started to lobby for active collaboration in the industry for registrars and registries to come together and share abuse mitigation strategies and intelligence with each other. This is because through our operations, we have observed that a lot of registries and even registrars have sophisticated abuse mitigation measures and they are quite committed to the work. Despite that, the abuse proliferates. There's little to no impact on the volumes of abuse. And for us within in the trust and safety team, it is like a never ending game of whack-a-mole. 
and i think this is primarily because abusers are not married to a domain name today they go and buy a dot online domain name and try to use it for abuse we find it we take it down they go to a registrar portal go buy another tld for example dot net if it's available at a cheaper or similar price and use that to continue their work abusers don't buy domain names for long term purposes so they are not attached to the name and easily move on from one domain to another domain so if we uh, as a registry or as a registrar if we keep the knowledge on the trend and pattern of abuse on the tlds only to ourselves a we are not helping anyone else b we should be aware that the domain the abuse would can come back to us again tomorrow so that's we are digging deeper holes for ourselves therefore as infrastructure providers we think we must act together whenever we can to keep the namespace clean for everyone these are some of the examples um where domain name abuse went unchecked in the beginning and turned into massive abuse campaigns leading to huge financial and reputational losses i will not go into detail of each one of them because all of them are very uh, popular instances and you can find a lot of information about them online but such kind of campaigns happen every single day and we see huge amounts of unauthorized access data theft and reputational and financial loss and uh, more worryingly there are active sextortion scams uh, happening all the time where cyber criminals send threatening emails to people claiming that they have compromising material imagery or videos on them and demanding ransom in some cases attackers use dns abuse to host phishing websites that appear convincing and that that tricks individual into revealing personal and financial information and those kind of uh, campaigns are getting more and more sophisticated in use and delivery every single day now a lot of you attending the webinar today i'm guessing that a lot of you are from content platforms and must have come across some sort of domain abuse either in your personal or professional capacities and i'm guessing and correct me if i'm wrong that if it's in professional capacities either you pass it on to your it teams or to trust and safety wing that handles spam or phishing report in our observation in our experience we have seen that most content platform or platform service providers when they come across abusive links or urls they block the url or the circulation of those urls stop the circulation of those urls on their respective platforms some very few go one step ahead and share it with other platforms so that others can stop it at their end as well but the challenge is that there are hundreds if not thousands of platforms where the same links could be circulating and even with all the good intentions and resources and measures it would be practically impossible for any platform to get the link blocked everywhere and that's where infrastructure providers like registries and registrars come in they have what we call colloquially the kill switch so they have the power to block the access of abusive urls across the internet in one click and that's why they can be very effective allies in stopping abuse at really early stages and this benefits everyone then this can significantly help increase user trust but despite benefits it doesn't happen often because there are a lot of challenges i am being from registry side i'm referring to challenges from a registry's perspective here i'm speaking for radix but based on my conversations with other registries out there i know that these are not unique to us almost all registries struggle with the same issues is and the primary issue is that we want to take prompt actions on abuse but often we cannot do so because of lack of reporting registries for the most part always have to go out and seek intelligence and report abuse they do not come to us naturally as they should and many times even when they do uh, they are quite delayed or come in a form where we do not have enough information to dig deeper uh, into them to make a call we have observed that there is little awareness and synchronicity in the larger internet industry about threat reporting and action channels i understand that trust and safety teams of any organization are in general 
so busy fighting uh, in fire fighting and just putting out fires on our own platforms that it sucks up all of our time and energy but i genuinely think that a lot of this fire fighting can be reduced if we collaborate a little bit more now apart from the resources and uh, the stuff that i talked about there is one another barrier to effective abuse handling for infrastructure providers and that's that there is no clear definition of abuse i can and other industry players have been engaging for long in intense conflictual but inconclusive debates about whether we as infrastructure providers should take action on content related abuse or not there is no mandate for it and it's a uh, industry realizes that it's a slippery slope like once you get into content content abuse moderation it just never ends but many registries like us we want to take down domains that have terrorism violent extremism or csam related material but the problem is we do not get those kind of reports those kind of reports rarely come to us and this goes back to my point of lack of awareness where we can pass on the information and reports to right actors for faster actions and i know rory is going to touch upon it uh, in a little bit so i'll not go further into it but i do want to reiterate that the trust and safety teams of platform providers and infrastructure providers have more in common than they think they both see operational abuse such as spam phishing malware and they both see content abuse but differing volumes of course but if we collaborate a little bit more leverage on each other's resources and expertise a little bit more there can be a streamlined and holistic way of acting fast um which can reduce the spread and make an impact that transcends beyond platforms and jurisdictions this slide i added this slide last minute because i noticed that a lot of you in your registration forms asked questions about the future of future or the development of abuse mitigation and ai i think uh, in fact we think that incorporation of ai into abuse mitigation has tremendous potential of making the process easier and faster we at radix are also investing in it quite a bit we now have a machine learning model that is fed with all the intel and abuse reports that we get it now screens all the domains registrations we get and tells us which domain have high likelihood of being used for abuse i have to be honest that it's not 100% efficient as of now and we don't rely on it too much because we want to avoid false positives and we don't want to accidentally penalize legitimate customers who might have who might have genuine websites running on the domain names but i do think the use will grow and improve and uh, we also think that ai can help us address some of the shortcomings that i just mentioned particularly with respect to continuous harmful content monitoring and generating automated streamlined reports uh, and passing them to right parties now towards the end i want to reiterate that dns abuse impacts all of us in some capacity it's not an infrastructure centric issue it spreads extremely fast and cuts across platforms and us working in silos and focusing um sorry i think i'm on a wrong slide yes that is correct now and the saying that us working in silos is only helping the abusers there is a massive scope of collaboration as i said among infrastructure providers themselves and among infrastructure providers and platform providers and that if we collaborate we can prevent many abuse campaigns be it operational or content related uh, from going large scale at really early stages and again stressing on one last point that registries and registrars have a huge vacuum when it comes to knowing and acting on harmful content related abuse and there we seek active help from platform providers and now i will let rory speak on it a little bit more thank you thanks very much neher and ani that was uh, super interesting and i'm sure we'll have plenty to, to discuss with the q and a after my presentation's done i'm just going to start sharing my screen and get it going 
uh, if I switch that, can I confirm that you can see the right screen, please, instead of the other presenter view? Yeah, we Perfect. see the presenter view now. Um, okay. We see the presenter view now. Previously, we saw the other one. <laughs> so you want me to switch it back? Which one do you want us to see? Do you want us to see presenter view or do you I want, want you to see, see just the slides. So Okay, so you um, need to switch it back. Yeah. Okay. Is that better? There we go. Perfect. Perfect. That's good. Thanks. Yeah, Sorry thank about you. that. No worries. Um, Zoom is always tricky uh, here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, despite uh, tech being in the name of my employer, sometimes I show that I'm not as good as it is. I think I am. Um, hi, everyone. I briefly introduced myself earlier. My name's Rory. I'm a senior open source intelligence analyst at Tech Against Terrorism. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Um, and I'm looking forward to sharing some knowledge with you uh, with regards to terrorist operated websites, which despite being a, a relative niche of uh, domain abuse and DNS abuse and general uh, misuse uh, online represents a significant threat and an increasingly growing problem. So without further ado, I'm just going to give you a quick intro into who we are. Tech Against Terrorism, otherwise known as TAT, is a public-private partnership launched by the United Nations Counterterrorism Committee Executive Directorates. Uh, we're not-for-profit, we're a non-governmental organization, and we're focused on knowledge sharing and providing critical support to tech platforms uh, with regards to all things terrorist and violent extremist abuse of the internet. We work across four main spaces, uh, starting with industry-led initiatives. Uh, we've worked with large organizations such as the Global Internet Forum to counter terrorism. We also focus on state-led activity and we do uh, work with, with nation states with regards to education and knowledge sharing. Uh, training as well is a, is a critical part of what we do, sharing that information so that it's actionable from others with the right level of context and information. We also uh, work very closely with civil society, which includes uh, academic organizations and those focused on counter speech and counter narratives. Human rights and freedom of expression is uh, at the core of everything we do. Um, naturally, counter terrorism can be uh, a difficult arena to operate in. And we find that when we have human rights and freedom of expression at the very forefront of everything we do, ranging from our own disruption to uh, helping tech platforms uh, improve their own capabilities, uh, we find that we have greater levels of success. We also work in uh, strategic communications. We do uh, op-eds and other academic work with uh, established researchers in the field. And as I said earlier, with counter speech and counter narrative strategies, we operate in that sphere too. In terms of mentorship, that's a key key part of what we do. Uh, fundamentally, we aim to help tech platforms, big and small, although we find that specifically smaller tech platforms are largely the ones at most at risk of terrorist exploitation. We work with any and all, um, and we very often bring them into mentorship programs where we give them bespoke custom policy support and practical guidance on how to mitigate terrorist risks and specific threats to their services. But I'll go into a little bit more detail with that uh, shortly. In terms of work streams, uh, we have three main ones, um, which is, is kind of underpinned by what I'm saying at the top about understanding terrorist activity, working with the platforms affected by it, and the platforms are willing to improve their capabilities in the event of any future exploitation, and building capacity through operationalizable support and knowledge sharing. Starting with outreach and building trust with platforms, we typically, through the course of our open source intelligence investigations and monitoring, of which I'm a part of, we find platforms that are specifically at risk, or we will find indications, say, that terrorists and violent extremists are looking to migrate and are looking for new places from which they can call home and share their propaganda from then. So we identify these platforms and we uh, do lots of different ways of getting in touch with them, the mentorship process being a key, critical part of that, um, which is multifaceted. Um, and I don't have enough time to talk about it, though I wish I could, because it's incredibly detailed and always bespoke um, with actionable outcomes. We develop relationships with tech platforms and we very frequently organize collaborative workshops uh, so that we can all get our heads together. We also support platforms to help them build capacity. The knowledge sharing platform is our bespoke website and a platform that offers uh, vast quantities of information related to terrorist use to the internet. This could be things that could help trust and safety teams identify content like branding, logos, memes, specific references, um, series of content and so on. But we also offer case studies, uh, key reports and primers and regulatory analysis of legislation across the globe. And another critical part of what we do is build tools and technical approaches 
um, to help support these tech platforms in need. Um, the terrorist content analytics platform being an absolutely massive part of that. The TCAP, as I said slightly earlier, is a bespoke tool that we use um, daily to alert tech platforms to the presence of terrorist content on their services. Through that as well, we hash content so that tech platforms can uh, implement that into their automated detection mechanisms. And we also have developed an API for tech platforms to use. Um, it's not on the slide either, but we are developing an archive of terrorist content as well, um, which aims to provide researchers and practitioners with a safe, secure, and well-being focused way of accessing terrorist content for the purposes of research. So that's a brief intro into TAT. But to talk more specifically about terrorist operator websites, if I could give you one takeaway from something that I'm saying today, it would be that terrorist operator websites undermine almost all efforts to counter terrorist use of the internet. I'll go into some details as to why, but it, in our view, represents a significant adversarial shift um, and is presenting serious problems uh, across the tech stack. So to start with the report that we published in January 2022, which feels like an incredibly long time ago now, but we've since updated our statistics here, um, essentially is an overview and, and a threat analysis, essentially, of um, terrorist operator websites. Um, our key findings now uh, include up to 288 un unique domains and URLs. Um, that's live on our records. We updated that today. Um, that's across the spectrum of ideologies. Um, including violent Islamist and violent far-right and extreme right-wing entities. But fundamentally, terrorist operated websites pose a significant threat. Um, they undermine a lot of what we do. Typically, uh, we found that over the years, uh, terrorist organizations and terrorist users online have migrated, although not wholesale, but they have migrated to smaller tech platforms where they're less subject to scrutiny and sophisticated content moderation techniques. They specifically use a process called outlinking, which is where you generate URLs on loads of different locations, all leading to the same bit of terrorist material. You share it in these smaller spaces and it's harder to detect. Um, as the industry and as nation states and communities and organizations have improved their capabilities in dealing with this, we've seen a return of terrorist operated websites, not a return in the sense that they weren't operating when these strategies are being employed by terrorist organizations and their supporters online, but we're seeing a resurgence in their use largely because it's very hard to get rid of them over a long period of time. And you don't need to rely on other services. You can just host everything on one website and, the website is, of course, saved. So if the domain gets suspended, you just register it elsewhere and everything is suddenly available to download again, um, which I guess is kind of what you were talking about there earlier in terms of how easy it is to, to migrate your website. As I said, the prevalence of these is largely due to improved content moderation by larger tech companies. But fundamentally, there's a lack of international mechanisms in place to support the tech sector and all the industries involved in that stack and countering this threat. Uh, the bottom line for us is that we want to improve collaboration between governments, infrastructure companies across the whole tech stack, academia, civil society, NGOs, and all those willing to be involved um, to develop effective and coordinated responses without compromising principles such as freedom of expression and other human rights. In terms of our methodology, and this is really important to talk about what we actually gauge as a terrorist operated website or a, a violent extremist operated website we have quite a strict scope naturally um i don't want people to think that we're just going around reporting websites um because we're not we there is a, a an evidentiary threshold and a process we go through to identify them uh, fundamentally we assess it to be highly likely that it's run by members of a designated terrorist entity um or supporters of that organization um typically this organization will have been prescribed sorry by at least one democratic government um or the website as i said here espouses or praises violent extremist ideologies uh whether that's associated with a specific movement or niche or with a group or individual um lack of designation can be a challenge sometimes with this when we're trying to get in touch with registrars to take down uh or disrupt a website if it's not designated uh it becomes particularly challenging if they're not willing to uh, or if they don't have mentions of violent extremism in their terms of service, which uh, we sometimes find to be the case. Um, we make this assessment on quite a few factors, um, evidence largely. Um, of course, we don't just look at websites. Tech Against Terrorism looks uh, at many, many tech platforms where we know terrorists and violent extremists are operating. And as such, we have um, an evidentiary history of mentions of websites and domain names. So, for example, 
if a URL to a uh, Al Qaeda affiliate has been linked in the same chat room for the last four years, but with a different top level domain and some sort of different variation of the domain name and the same brandings on the front, the same content is available on it. We have uh, a very confident understanding that that is going to be a terrorist operator website. Um, promotion as well is absolutely critical, uh, especially when looking at legislation uh, specifically, um, promotion of uh, official terrorist organizations in many countries uh, con constitutes material support, for example, which um, is an offense. But if we see blatant promotion um, of content either generated by the entity or uh, quite clearly in support of it, then uh, we tend to include that into our database. Uh, if we see promotion on other channels, as I said earlier, to this site, then that's obviously quite a clear indicator, especially, especially if these spaces have been live for quite a significant period of time. Um, what else have we got here? Uh, endorsement, I talked about that. Um, or if we've got identification from colleagues and those in spaces that we operate with, uh, with regards to countering terrorist use of the internet already. Um, we don't just obviously take that for gospel, we do our own investigations, but if we are interacting with organisations or entities that have uh, expertise in this area, then that tends to help too. Um, collaboration is key to mitigating this threat, um, so we're very much keen to see more and more of that. So to, to provide some context, um, as I've said so far already, um, terrorists are struggling to reach a broad audience online um, by and large. I don't want that to be like a blanket statement because I don't think it's necessarily true. But we do find overall that tech platforms, uh, larger ones, have become increasingly more competent. Uh, uh, moderating terrorist content online and they've become more sophisticated at identifying it as well so it's become harder for these groups and entities and pieces of content sometimes it's just singular pieces of terrorist material uh, uploaded by a supporter for example to stay live um, so we found overall that they've migrated to other services um, and we found now that there's a higher concentration of terrorist actors on smaller tech platforms or tech platforms that lack the capacity um, to, to action it be that through terms of service or policy creation or technical capabilities um we found that there's an increasing trend of entities moving uh, to these kind of platforms to share their content but as this is still improving and as the work that for example tech against terrorism is doing and all those it works with uh, across several different industries um are becoming more competent at uh, helping these platforms um deal with these threats even the small ones we've seen an increased response uh, and we've seen more terrorist operator websites coming up and staying up for longer as well, critically. Um, but to give a, a, a summary of uh, terrorist operator websites, they're publicly available almost every single time. Sometimes they're gated by a login um, or you have to register as a user and you'll get access to an archive, terabytes of content, for example. But more often than not, they're publicly available and you can quite often find them through search engines, uh, which is particularly alarming. Uh, so if you know, say, that uh, a terrorist operator website has since been disrupted, but uh, it's likely that it's still indexed or it's likely that uh, the same name for the website but with a different domain name has been indexed, you can just search for the, you can just search for the name of the outlet, for example, or the name of the website, and you'll still get a new result, even if it's um, not the same URL of domain name. So they're stable, by and large. Um, which is quite challenging and they are very often uh, using legitimate or exploiting legitimate infrastructure like everybody else. Um, terrorists tend to use the same kind of technology that we do, obviously for nefarious purposes, but for the same reasons, which is stability, and the functions and features, features they offer, ease of access and so on. Um, so it's no surprise really that they're exploiting legitimate infrastructure providers um, without them being aware of it. We find sometimes as well that there's um, little requirement for, for content moderation, as we said, uh, and as you alluded to, Neha, as well. It's not something that's always been the area of internet infrastructure providers, content abuse. Um, we're not saying necessarily that it should be, but it is um, undeniably linked. If there is content abuse appearing on a terrorist operator website that is also exploiting the domain name system, then there needs to be some sort of relationship there. Um, but that's where the collaboration is required to make this um, a process that isn't too resource intensive for uh, all parties involved. We also found sometimes that the threshold for removal is higher 
Um, sometimes we find that some infrastructure providers don't actually reference terrorism or violent extremism in their terms of service and only really look at the kind of conventional understandings of uh, DNS abuse, which is largely, of course, focused on cybercrime and cyber espionage, understandably as well. Of course, the majority of threats faced to infrastructure providers on a daily basis is going to be from cyber criminal uh, activity or fraudulent activity. But nonetheless, terrorists uh, still exploit their services, so solutions need to be found. Um, and there's also services that you can use to uh, be registered on behalf of, essentially. Um, we're not saying that this shouldn't be a thing. It's critical for freedom of expression, especially in places where freedom of press and freedom of expression is inhibited um, and limited. We understand these processes and these uh, organizations are important, but they too are being exploited by terrorist organizations uh, to essentially register a website without their name or personal details affiliated with it. So they have that relative layer of anonymity online, which can be challenging to counter. Um, to talk about the primary functions of terrorist operator websites quickly, just so you understand what's actually on them. Obviously, I can't I can't show you them, but this is the kind of stuff we find. Uh, they are typically used to disseminate propaganda and other forms of media and material. You don't need to be exploiting a small uh, tech platform if you can just save your website and upload it a day later and all the content is still there we're aware of terrorist operated websites that have been active for years on the same domain names um, they're incredibly hard to disrupt and once you have access to it there's terabytes of terrorist content all of which um, will be technically subject to uh, sanctions uh, th these are from designated entities by and large with these large uh, longer living sites their archives and they aggregate content as well. So they can signpost to other locations and other websites, uh, networks, for example, with pro Islamic state websites all linked to each other and they will update their databases when a new one goes down. So if you, if you lose one, as long as you know another, you can find them. Um, so that's quite challenging. Of course, as well, communication and recruitment, um, direct communication specifically. So I'm not talking about narratives or radicalization here. I'm talking about getting in touch and sharing information that could be operationally or strategically valuable to these organizations. Um, a lot of them had contact inboxes and so on, which is alarming to say the least. And we've seen increasingly that a lot of these terrorist entities uh, are using uh, cryptocurrency signposted on these websites to generate revenue and funds. Um, which of course is, adds, adds a whole new layer of complexity with regards to terrorist financing. In a nutshell, that's what we're seeing on, on terrorist operator websites. To give a bit of analysis of them, um, between January 2020 and uh, today, we have recorded 288 terrorist and violent extremist operator websites. Uh, this is up from the previously recorded 198 that we published in the January 2022 report that I talked about earlier. To give a bit of an idea of the um, breakdown of uh, sites by ideology, these are the ones that are largely in scope at the minute. Um, 151 violent Sunni Islamist TWs, uh, 17 violent Shia Islamist TWs, that's terrorist operated websites, and 120 violent far right and extreme right wing uh, websites too. Not all of them are live, but that's a database of them. Um, and it can be challenging, of course, to retrieve the correct technical details when a site isn't. Uh, live anymore because it could be parked it could be a relatively benign domain name that is now being used for legitimate purposes and we don't want to be recording those kind of details because th there's no reason to and it's not accurate um so we do find sometimes that gathering all of the technical details around these domains which we believe is incredibly important in, in uh analyzing their activities and potentially predicting future patterns of exploitation can be quite a challenge um, but we've identified over 30 different website infrastructure providers being exploited by those operating these domains um, which is quite significant um, and to give a highlight of what we've done in 2023 so far we facilitated the removal of 24 terrorist operator websites relating to actors such as al-qaeda and islamic state this is an example of a pro-Islamic state domain uh, that has been active since 2021. It uh, has archives, terabytes and terabytes of content in over 18 different languages, and it's changed top-level domains at least 11 times since first appearing online in July uh, two years ago. That's probably up to 12 now in the last week, but it's incredibly active. Uh, it's resilient. Uh, we, we we assessed that it's probably registering multiple domains at a time. So when one goes down, they just move it on. Um, 
so it's a really really challenging approach to actually kind of meaningfully disrupt it so to move on to what we're doing about it which i think is critical in terms of collaboration and so on is we're scaling up our disruption um which is really important. So we are directly engaging with providers uh, via abuse reports. Um, we, we published a mitigation strategy uh, last year, which included lots of guidelines. Um, this is obviously based on evidentiary thresholds, but to give some challenges, we're finding that registrars sometimes ignore us or aren't uh, willing to cooperate with our law enforcement or legal approaches, which is completely understandable, but it can slow down the process um, the creation of terms of service for some of these providers might become more important as time goes on. And as I said, they're becoming a lot quicker to register. Um, we're also building a database on the knowledge sharing platform that uh, is going to be uh, available only for infrastructure providers and those working in the internet tech stack um, to essentially see our record of terrorist websites. They can check it with theirs and they can uh, then understand domain names and see patterns of exploitation, which could help mitigate future risks. We're also developing a dedicated work stream for mentorship, um, content standards and respect for rights, as I said, is incredibly important. Um, we'll also be providing improved understanding in terms of terrorist content and uh, how to effectively take down these domains, um, alerting through the TCAP, for example, and of course, as well, uh, providing guidance on how to create transparency reports so that everything is visible and accountable and um, compliant with human rights. Um, yeah, that's uh, the TRW's issue in a nutshell. Um, thank you very much for listening. I probably ran over a little bit there. Apologies for that. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to having some questions. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you to all three of you. We got started a bit late, so I ran over my introduction. So I want to acknowledge that. Uh, we do have a little bit of time for a Q&A. Um, and we had one question come in. And so I will read it to the panelist. Uh, what is a usual investigation pathway for you to identify abuse of domains and how much of that is automated versus manual? Thank you, Amanda, I'll take it. And maybe then Anu can help add bits and pieces to it if I missed anything. I think we have addressed the manual, automated versus manual part a little because we are trying to, we have just dipped our toes into automating the processes, but it hasn't come into uh, full flesh operations. And I'm not just talking about Radix, I'm talking about other registries as well. Everybody's trying to automate their abuse mitigation practices. They are uh, feeding all the intelligence reports that they receive from security agencies and the abuse um, intel that they go out and manually collect into their abuse prediction models or machine learning models and trying to train the model to identify abuse proactively on all the new registered domains. In terms of investigations, when a domain name gets reported to us for abuse, sometimes uh, it gets comes with a lot of information as in for what is it reported? Is it reported for spam? Is it reported for phishing? Is it reported for malware? And based on the information that is available on the report, there are a lot of other things that you can interpret. For example, you can identify registration patterns. For example, something is reported for phishing and if there is a, if there is a URL which says Neha pay secure one at dot online and then report Neha pay secure one is reported, Neha pay secure two is reported, three is reported, and then we see four, five, six, seven again registered at the same time and have very similar identical names. There's very high chance that they are also going to be used for phishing. And then there are uh, signs of brand, clear cut brand infringement like. Uh, Facebook.online would be like, face. first of all, there shouldn't be a Facebook.online because there should be a Facebook.com, but instead of, oh, they would use numerical zero. So there are patterns. If you look closely, you can identify, and sometimes you can identify hints of malicious intent as well. So we take note of that. And then depending on what we have found, we take actions. Um, Anu, in case I've missed anything, you might add. Yeah, absolutely. You have uh, covered uh, pretty much the, the entire pathway. Uh, so basically what, what actually happens is we have two different uh, methods of, uh, of abuse, abuse mitigation, one being the reactive and the other being the proactive, right? The reactive part is where we, we of course, collect intel from uh, security agencies and based on the credibility of the intel, uh, domain names are, for, uh, are suspended. Uh, but then uh, that doesn't end up uh, end there, right? We use that particular intel to uh, add to another machine learning phase or uh, or 
uh, or maybe identify similar pattern registrations uh, uh, within our portfolio and hunt for such uh, names and then further uh, review those names uh, maybe based on the the registration uh, informations, the uh, the name servers associated with it, or the domain names, uh, or the registrant information, the owner of the domain names. If we get those information from the registrars, of course, but of uh, also uh, we look for DGA. Uh, inputs as well, right? Whether a domain name belongs to a particular uh, domain generating algorithm or not. So we there is a bunch of uh, variables that is associated to a particular domain registration and we consider all these variables, add that to a machine learning. The machine learning then gives us a, a, a shorter list of domain names and then we manually review uh, those uh, those names, the shorter list of names to just to ensure that there's no false positive that happened, uh, right? And then only after uh, high credibility is when we go ahead and suspend their domain names. Wonderful, thank you both so much. We have a, another question that is actually three questions that I feel like we don't have time to address, <laughs> um, but I do wanna share it. And I want to let the audience know that what we'll do is, um, Kristen will save all the questions that weren't answered and we'll include those in a summary email that we send out to all everyone who registered, whether or not they attended. And uh, we'll give our panelists a chance to answer those questions if they'd like offline so you can get an answer. So the final question was, what needs to happen for us to be able to tackle domain abuse like terrorist websites more effectively? Who needs to act and how can domain hosts protect themselves from being used? So these are three really, really excellent questions that might take a while to unpack. So we'll ask our panelists to respond uh, offline to that. Um, I just wanna thank all of the panelists today, uh, really just a spirit of collaboration uh, in that, you know, initially this was uh, a presentation that Radix was going to give and uh, TAT said, we'd like to join and, um, Miha and Ani were like, great, we'd love for them to join. So they they said collaboration is key, but they really uh, modeled their philosophy as well, even in approaching this webinar. Uh, they put that theory into practice and said, yes, we'd love to collaborate. So just so much appreciation for the three of you, so much appreciation for those who attended. We have some more questions coming in that again, we'll share offline with our panelists and then share out with all of you who registered in a summary email. We'll be posting this recording According to YouTube. Um, so if you registered but didn't attend, you can see it there. And if you're joining us on YouTube, uh, you can check out uh, tspa.org. You can also check out Radix and uh, TAT, uh, Tech Against Terrorism as well. Check out their websites. Um, thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. And uh, we look forward to learning more from you in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you for having us. Bye-bye.